Yo, what's up everybody, Professor V here, and this is what you missed in week three of the fall 2018 semester. Let's go. Starting with my general psychology courses at Wharton County Junior College, I will begin with cognitive appraisal. Depending on the class you're in, it may or may not have been covered. For those classes that I covered cognitive appraisal, consider this a review. As I stated in class, stress is normal. We are supposed to experience it. It aids us on determining what environments to avoid. Thus, the goal of dealing with stress is not to completely get rid of all the stressors, but to manage them. Many stressors we cannot escape from entirely, so we need to learn how to cope with the stressors to decrease the level of stress experienced. A lot of the stress responses we experience is controlled by the autonomic nervous system and thus happens unconsciously. The key to reducing the effectiveness of a stressor or reducing the amount of stress you experience is to consciously recognize you are stressed. Cognitive appraisal aids in being able to recognize the stressor and help you determine the best way to deal with the stressor. When we experience a stressor, research shows we begin to determine the threat level of a stressor. This is the initial stage of cognitive appraisal, primary appraisal. You answer the question to yourself, is the stressor harmful, potentially harmful, or not harmful? This may be done quickly, consciously or unconsciously. For instance, we have talked about being chased by a dog. Imagine yourself jogging in your neighborhood and all of a sudden you hear a dog barking behind you. Your sympathetic nervous system initiates the stress response. You enter the alarm stage of stress. You quickly turn around and see the dog is a chihuahua. You appraise or judge it as non-threatening and your parasympathetic nervous system becomes active and brings your body quickly down to a normal resting state, not worrying about the dog. However, what if the dog was a large, growling, shark-toothed pit bull? Oh, not that one. His name is Thunder and he's my sister's pit bull and he's a pansy, but it's okay, we all love him. Now you assess the stressor and you deem it harmful threatening and you enter the alarm stage of stress. You also assess the stressor even further and enter the second stage of cognitive appraisal, secondary appraisal. You determine if there are any available or potential resources to aid in the coping process. When we attempt to resolve the stress, we often choose between emotion-focused coping and problem-focused coping. Often, we combine both emotion focused and problem focused coping. Emotion focused coping is when we attempt to manage and regulate our emotional reactions to stressors. Often, this may be the only option when the source of the stress is out of the person's control. There are positive ways to use emotion focused coping, such as distracting yourself from the stressor by keeping busy, Disclosure of your emotions to others, praying, asking for guidance, meditation, and journaling. You are taking your emotions and channeling them into something more productive. However, there are negative ways to use emotion-focused coping, such as overindulging in unhealthy comfort food, drinking alcohol, using drugs, and even suppressing the emotions. Suppressing emotions for a long period of time can compromise the immune system further and lead to poor health. Problem-focused coping strategies target the stress in more practical ways and deals with the stressors and the situations causing the stress head on. Some strategies include problem solving, time management, or obtaining necessary and professional social support. An example would be if you want to apply a problem-focused form of coping to answering difficult questions on this exam. Your best strategy will be to mark the difficult ones and return to answer them after checking other questions for clues. Other ways to manage stress is based on personality and individual differences of people 
One of the most important resources of stress management is the ability to control the situation or at very least perceived or have a sense of personal control. Those who believe that they are in control, masters of their own destinies, if you will, have internal locus control. They believe they are in control and as a result often make more effective and healthy decisions and are likely to cope positively to stressors. However, those with an external locus of control believe that chances or something that they cannot control determined their fate. They often feel powerless to change their situations and thus do anything about their stressors. They are less likely to make effective and positive changes. For example, you get to work late. Someone with an external locus of control will say the cause of their late arrival was due to traffic. Too many people on the road caused them to be late. This reason is perceived as out of control from the person. They believe that it is the traffic's fault and they cannot change it and thus will continue to be late to work not adjusting their behavior and continue to experience the stressor. Someone with an internal locus of control would see it as they left their house too late. They would believe that if they would have left their home earlier, they would have had enough time to sit in the traffic if necessary. Thus, they would adjust their behavior to avoid the stress of being late to work the next day by leaving their home earlier than usual. Some people have a unique trait, positive effect. This means that they are more often than others without this trait to experience and express positive emotions. They often experience less time getting ill and less distractions, especially on the road. It has been shown that those with a positive effect get into less car accidents. They have better sleep quality, longer life expectancies, and a wider and better sense of humor. Seeing the good in the bad, being able to see the best in everything is optimism, expecting that stressors will pass over. Optimism is also highly linked to positive effect. Optimism is the expectation that positive things will happen in the future despite the current stressful situations. Other resources for healthy living include mindfulness-based stress reduction. This is a program in which people are trained to develop a new train of thought towards events. It aids in the development of a state of consciousness that attends to current events in a receptive and non-judgmental way. This has been linked to more positive brain changes. Social support is also very big to aid with stress. Talking to those around us, our friends and family aid us in being able to process the stressors that we deal with. Just talking about it may help you understand the stressor even more. Friends and family that listen makes us feel as if we matter and make us feel important and is incredibly helpful with not only stress management, but maintaining a high self-esteem, a good well-being, and good health. In other words, don't be afraid to reach out for help. Those were some of the concepts that we needed to skip or did not have enough time to get to in class. Be sure to go over these concepts on your own textbooks as well. And let me know if you have any questions. Also, be certain to go over techno stress towards the end of the chapter. Now, let's move into lifespan, growth, and development. We didn't have time to go over the environmental influences of prenatal development. There are several to go over. Malnutrition can cause several different effects on an unborn child as seen here in this slide. It is incredibly important to maintain a proper diet during pregnancy and supplement the diet to be certain that infants are born healthy and develop motor function properly. Teratins are other environmental hazards that may do damage to the embryo or fetus while still developing in the womb. These things can be drugs, both legal and illegal, prescribed or over the counter, diseases the mother comes into contact with, other pathogens, and even radiation. STI, such as syphilis, can cause a miscarriage or stillbirth. Stillbirth is when death of a child occurs during delivery. Syphilis, as well as HIV and AIDS, can be passed down from mother to child as well. 
when the blood vessels in the mother and baby rupture, this enables an exchange in blood, allowing the transmission of STIs. When the mother suffers from rubella, which is a viral infection, this can cause low intelligence in the child as well as heart disease. Sometimes it may be difficult to fall asleep while pregnant for various reasons. However, do not be tempted to take sedatives or sleep aids as they can stunt the growth of your child, especially the limbs. When we were discussing hormones and their correlation to homosexuality in class, some of you ask, how are mothers exposed to more androgens? Well, I said a couple in class, but honestly, totally forgot about this way. Women who are at risk for miscarriage, whether it be due to age, health, or any other reason, they may be prescribed progestin. This is a synthetic hormone that helps with caring to full term. However, has been shown to masculinize the fetus during development in the womb. It is a synthetic androgen. DES, another hormone that is given to reduce the chances of a miscarriage, does not masculinize the fetus due to it being an estrogen. However, it increases the chance of cervical, vaginal, and testicular cancer in the child. Also, expecting mothers should avoid excessive use of vitamins as high doses of vitamin A and D can cause severe damage to the nervous system, small head size, and heart defects. I've probably stated in class when the topics of drugs come up that we have all been told to avoid drugs because Because drugs are bad, okay? I'm not going to lecture you on not to do drugs. You already know this, but you should also be aware of some of the consequences of doing drugs during a pregnancy. Alcohol use during pregnancy can cause fetal alcohol syndrome. Do not listen to the people who say that one glass of wine a day is okay during a pregnancy. This can still result in fetal alcohol syndrome, abbreviated as FAS. You see, the effects here of FAS on the brain of an infant, and it remains like this for the duration of their life, causing numerous defects, including low intelligence, behavior problems, issues with vision and hearing, poor motor control and coordination, and other problems. Again, not going to drill you on not to smoke, however, know the consequences of smoking during pregnancy, including intellectual disabilities, higher chance in developing ADHD, or possibly even stillborn or die soon after birth. Lastly, for chapter two, a parent's age can have an effect on the child. Men can have children well into advanced ages, however, the older the father is, the more likely they will produce abnormal sperm and thus causing various issues including autism spectrum disorder, as well as heart defects or limb defects. The ideal age for women to have children is during their 20s, however, this doesn't mean they cannot have children past the age of 29. Women's fertility just decreases after 29 gradually until their mid 30s and then it rapidly declines afterwards. The chances of a miscarriage also increases as women pass the age of 30 and more significantly after the age of 40. Moving on to items we didn't cover in chapter three. A newborn infant spends much of their time sleeping, approximately 16 hours a day. The majority of their time asleep is spent in REM sleep where dreams occur. This is a stage of sleep characterized by irregular breathing, muscle twitches, and rapid eye movements. As they get older, the time spent in REM sleep decreases. You can refer to page 66 in your textbook and look at figure 3.6 to see the time we spend in each stage of sleep as we age. As infants, we spend a lot of time in REM sleep because it is suggested that the brain requires a lot of stimulation to allow for the creation of proteins in the brain that are used for the development of neurons in the brain. When it comes to brain activity, REM sleep mimics very closely to being awake. Infants cry for various reasons and distinct cries are used for certain reasons. One reason is due to pain. Others are due to anger or hunger. Parents often wonder if they will be able to understand their baby, especially if it's the parent's first child. However, parents typically learn how to distinguish the pitches of their baby's cries and what each signifies, whether it be hunger, 
anger, or pain. When an infant appears to have prolonged, high-pitched cries, these are signs of a serious health problem, such as chromosomal abnormalities, malnutrition, or exposure to narcotics as discussed earlier in the video when talking about drugs and other carriages. When a parent or primary caretaker responds to their infants crying, the crying behavior changes. They adapt their crying behavior in response to the caretaker. The more crying is ignored, the less amount of crying the infant does. However, remember the reasons for crying behavior. Just because you want their crying to stop does not mean to ignore their crying. Remember the reasons why they cry. Hunger, pain, and anger. These are things that need to be addressed. Also, persistent crying can have a negative effect or a strain on the relationship between infants and mother or other primary caretaker. Remember an infant is in the first stage of psychosexual development, the oral stage. This is a point in which the mouth is the erogenous zone and they find pleasure at the mouth and anything that involves the mouth. Sucking on a pacifier has an incredibly soothing effect on infants. Parents can further soothe infants by picking them up, caressing them, and rocking them back and forth, and speaking to them in a low-pitched voice tone. Remember, each infant is different from another, and parents may find what worked for a previous child does not work on their current child, and thus they learn by trial and errors to determine the best course of care. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, also known as SIDS, is death of a baby while sleeping and occurs because a baby stops breathing. Luckily, SIDS has been declining, however, it is still a serious condition. It is more common in those children that have complications at birth or have been exposed to various pterogens and other harmful substances during development. You can see here that there are higher correlations with SIDS in male babies than female babies and higher correlations with bottle-fed babies. This doesn't guarantee SIDS as doesn't any of these conditions. However, they are just more likely. It has been seen in a study produced by a children's hospital in Boston that the medulla, which we learned in class, that the medulla has a large role in respiration with serotonin being a neurotransmitter used in the medulla. However, in children who died due to SIDS, it was shown that the medulla was not as reactive to serotonin. Here is a list of suggestions to avoid SIDS, especially if they are high risk. One of them you must monitor really closely, the first one. If you lay an infant down on its back, they are more prone to suffocate or drown if they spit up or throw up during their sleep. Be cautious. Also, please look at the last one. Don't be victim to scams that state that their medication can reduce the chances of SIDS. Always consult with a pediatrician before giving your infant any medication. And that's it. That's what you missed in week three of class. Thank you for watching and please let me know if you have any questions regarding the material either in class or below in the comments if watching on YouTube. If watching on Blackboard, hover your mouse over the video and in the right hand corner, you'll see the text YouTube pop up. If you click it, you will be directed to YouTube. Anyways, if you like this video and if you think it was helpful, please hit the like button and I will see you in the next video. Ciao.